Hello, good evening and good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is safe and healthy. Thank you for being with us again this week. Today, we're going to talk about configuring and accessing the latest Serant formats. Today is a co-hosted event for South Asia, India, Middle East, the Arab Emirates and the Gulf states, as well as North America. So we've got a very diverse group, so welcome everyone. I am Frederick from Sound United, joining you today from Hong Kong. And for this event, we'll have actually well over 500 registered participants already. So for that, we would like to thank all our partners across the region for promoting our webinars and giving us an awesome audience. Joining us as well from their homes are my colleagues Jim from Minnesota and Jen in San Diego, California. We will be answering your questions online and live, so feel free to use the question tab in your top right corner at any time. Our host tonight, again, or today, is Phil Jones, joining us from his lovely home in San Diego in his early morning. Take it away, Phil. Good morning to my 500 closest friends. Welcome to my home again. My name is Phil Jones. I am the Director of Training for Sound United, and I'd like to talk to you today about Surround Sound. Now, of course, um, we have a large group and we want to answer your questions. So please put your questions in the question tab um, on your screen. And, and during the session, we will try our best to either answer the questions um, either in the chat or I will answer them during the conversation. Any questions that we do not get to, we promise that we will answer in a later FAQ. But today we wanna to talk about all the different surround sound technologies that are available on the market today. And um, as because I'm part of Sound United, along with uh, the rest of the crew, we are really committed to making sure you get the best sound from your sound systems, um, as well as all the video stuff we've talked about before. So I am the director of training for all of the brands, Den & Morantz, Class A Definitive, Boston Acoustics, and Polk Audio. So, and of course, a large part of our, what we do has to do with surround sound. So what we want to talk about is all of the different formats that are available. It's fun to be talking about audio again after the last few weeks of talking HDMI cables and two point this and, and LLM this and all that stuff. So it's nice to talk about surround because video without audio is just surveillance. It's surround that really pulls you in to what you're listening to and what you're watching. And the nice thing about our Denon and Marantz products is we support all of the major um, immersive surround sound formats. No, no other brand support, supports them all. And, um, we support Auro 3D and IMAX Enhanced, DTSX, uh, Adobe Atmos, all of them. So the nice thing is, regardless of the disc you buy and um, or your client buys, if you put it in a, in a, in a Blu-ray player, most likely a Marantz will be able or Denon will be able to play back that um, for in the best format that's available on that disc. So that's what makes us unique. You'll notice that Aural 3D and IMAX Enhance are limited to our higher end models. That has to do with the channel count. You have to have a certain amount of channels, at least nine, um, uh, in order to effectively um, you, uh, relate or, uh, or deliver those different surround sound formats. So it's limited to our, our receivers and AVRs with higher channel counts and better processing. We have receivers, um, the um, X8500 and the AVR8805 that can do up to 13 channels of processing plus, um, your, of course, your LFE, which gives us the ability to give you great multi-channel surround sound from a variety of formats in a variety of speaker layouts from 9.1.4, 7.1.6. Um, we have a tremendous amount of, um, of support for each of these formats. We're gonna cover each format one by one in the next hour um, and explain what they are and how they differ. Um, but we just wanna let you know that if you're looking for a great format, we can give you some of the best. I believe we're the only receivers out there that still support, that can support 13.1. There are some high-end processors that can support higher, but when it comes to AVRs and, pro, and, and, pro, and, and receivers, um, we are um, the leader when it comes to this. Before we get started, we gotta talk about the difference. Um, between channel-based and object-based surround sound. So let's discuss that first because that determines, um, has a big effect on the speaker layouts and configurations and things like that. So the first thing, we, we're all familiar with regular surround sound. 
um, 7.1, 5.1, 9.1. Well, that is basically surround sound, almost like a horizon. It goes around you. So all the way around you, almost like 360 degrees. So it, um, um, but it's all on one plane, horizontal, at one horizontal plane. And the, we all notice that always the, the main speakers that are of the most concern are always going to be your left, your left front, your right front, and your center. Why? Because the majority of the soundtrack is going to come from those speakers. They're going to be tasked with delivering the most bass. The center channel is where most of the dialogue comes from. The majority of what you're hearing is going to come from those channels. Those are the first channels people should invest the most in because it makes the biggest difference. In my house, I have Wilson's um, for my left, right, and my center, and I use Definitive in the back. I would love to have Wilson's in the back. I can't afford them. Um, and the Definitives were great for surround sound um, applications. But dialogue and stuff comes from that left, right, center, that left, right, center. The next thing is by adding those surround, um, the surrounds and the surround backs, we could jump up to 7.1. And then by adding the front wide left and the front wide right, right, we can jump up to 9.1. So that, but that all, like I said, is around the horizon. And that's how most of the channel-based formats ex, um, exist, except for one, which we'll talk about later. Um, channel-based surround sound is done by panning, just like you do with stereo. If I have a left speaker and a right speaker, and I play the same sound in both speakers at the same level, it, you, it will seem like that sound is coming from between the two speakers. That is the way that stereo works, and that's how phantom imaging works in stereo. When a mixing engineer is mixing a movie, basically all he's doing is he's, uh, if I want that sound to come from between two speakers, say my left front and my left surround, I mix it evenly between those two speakers, and it will feel like, it is in between those two speakers. So the engineer has to physically pan that sound, each sound um, from speaker to speaker to speaker to speaker manually by changing the level, the mix of each particular speaker. And that's how I move objects around the room in a horizontal plane. But it's done manually. Object-based surround is done completely different. We use the term 7.1.6 or 5.1.4 or, or, 5 or 9.1.4 to describe object-based um, um, systems, but the actual concept has nothing really to do with channels. The sound engineer basically creates a sound, a bullet, a bell, okay, a Mack truck, and then he assigns information to that particular sound. Um, where is it located in space? And, and Adobe, Atmos, and DTS have different ways to explain those coordinates, but they're still both describing location. How high up and where in the room is it located? The next thing is how big is the size of the, of the, of the sound? The scale. Is it a small, tiny thing or a large object like a Mack truck or, or an elephant? And then the next thing is um, diffusion and focus. Is it something that kind of washes across the entire um, stage, like a crowd? Or is it like the, a bullet whizzing by, or like a bell, or me rapping on a table? So, um, so where's it located? How big of the, uh, of the, uh, is that sound? And how diffuse or how focused it is? That is the metadata that is actually put onto um, the, the soundtrack um, and that is sent to your receiver. Once it gets to your receiver, your receiver has a processor that renders the objects in, in space based on the channels you have available. The metadata says this bell needs to be right here, left of me, sitting right, right here. So the speaker system, the receiver will look at how many speakers I have to make it seem like that bell is ringing right here. Um, it is channel, it is layout, um, independent of your speaker layout. It is scalable. I like object-based uh, surround sound because um, it will grow with the channels in your system. I've been around long, a very long time, Jim and I, and I, I can ask Jim how many surround sound formats he has lived through in the 20 something years he has been in audio and he will tell you dozens. Seems like before every time they wanted to enhance the surround sound system, 
uh, Dolby, Dolby Surround, Dolby Pro Logic, Dolby Pro Logic 2, Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus. They just keep adding and adding and adding. And every time they wanted to increase the amount of channels, it required a new format. That's not how this is done now. What happens is there is a object in space located right here. And as I add more channels, it's just better at making that sound seem like it's coming from right here. That's it. So buy once, cry once. You buy this disc, it will continue to grow with your system. Start off at 5.14, great. You go crazy and do 24.1.10, that same disc will still be utilized for that. So it will grow with your, um, with your systems and your client systems as they grow. So that's one of the things I really like about object-based systems because it's not channel dependent. So this is actually uh, kind of, if you had a mixer a, um, to how they mix the channels, there is basically 128 objects they can put in space. To make the sound, to make it backwards compatible, the, um, they take, they take 7.1 or 9.1, say they take 9.1. They take 10 objects and make them basically stationary, stay here. Um, you're the make believe you're the left speaker, you're the right speaker, you're the center channel, you're the rear um, surround, you're the surround back, you're the, you're the wide left, you're the wide right. So that makes it backwards compatible because those objects are locked in space. Then I have a total of about 118 objects left over when it comes to Dolby Atmos to whiz around the room. So you can see here on the left, is all the objects I could choose from. And then I can, it's literally a joystick and I can maneuver those objects in this cube here and determine where I want them to be. The bigger they are is the size. The, if they're fuzzy, that is the focus. And if they're bright, that is the volume. So I can literally see where I want, I can physically place that in the room. Um, and then once I place that in the room, the system will use all the speakers at its disposal in order to make it appear there. So in this room, they're using, you can see the layout, which is in the middle. So that is the layout that is in this room right here. Looks like it's a 7.1.4. And they're mixing multiple objects. You can see what objects they're missing. They're mixing and where they want those objects to fly around the room. So this is kind of how you would see it if you walk into a studio. As we said, there's an object-based audio renderer in your AVR, in your processor, that will take that positional metadata and look at it and scale, and scale the audio object using the channels that you have available to put that object where it's supposed to be in space. And because object-oriented systems are scalable, um, the, the loudspeaker layout is, can be a variety of layouts, 7.1.4, 5.1.4, 24.1.10, .10. it just, I can grow. All I'm trying to do is I just have more speakers and more processing to put that object in that physical space. So that is the main difference. It's, so we use the term channel, but we're really, it, it really isn't channel based. Um, it, the channel number is just how many channels do I have to put the object in space? It's not how many channels was it recorded in, because it's not recorded and channels. So basically, um, think of it this way, those set, like I said, that 7.1 or, or, or 9.1, those 10 channels act like objects. They're actually objects that don't move. That's how they make it backwards compatible. And then they take the, uh, and then I could take the other additional audio objects and whiz speak and, and fly stuff all over the room. And then the system will use the speakers that are available to, to make that object appear to be moving um, in space to the proper location at the proper size. So that is how that works. So it's backwards compatible just because they're using nine of the channels or actually 10 of the channels as, as fixed objects. So that's why you can use Atmos content on a non-Atmos system. The next thing. In order to do this, the older systems were 7.1, where all, all the speakers were around the horizon. Things went around you, but they didn't go over you, over the top of your head. 
you were not in a sphere or, or a or a or a glow a cone of sound like not cone a a a, a dome of sound. So object based utilizes height speakers. There, there's you can use overheads built into the ceiling. Um, you can use wall mounted ones mounted high in the walls, or you can use height enabled speakers that direct sound upward and that is reflected off of the ceiling. In my home. I actually use the in um, in ceiling speakers, and I, I use the in ceiling speakers in my home right above me. Um, my roof is actually vaulted, so what I did was I bought in walls the the definitive ultimate in wall, which actually is designed to be mounted to. They actually fire at a 45 degree angle, so even though they're mounted like this, the cones are sitting like that. So even so, I can have down firing effect on a vaulted ceiling. So if you have an in ceiling in, you need to be able to angle the drivers to make the sound fire um, for Adobe Atmos straight down. So I use the ultimate in walls to achieve that effect. So even in, in a vaulted on a vaulted ceiling. Um, of course, you've, I could have used um, um, on walls and angled them down if I wanted to. My wife wanted the room to be a little cleaner or I, um, in my room, the difficult one would have been height-enabled speakers. So let's talk a little bit about height-enabled speakers real quick. So height-enabled speakers are great for many applications because there's a lot of rooms where you want that immersive surround sound experience. You want that sense of height, that dome of sound, but you just either because it's too much of a hassle or you physically cannot do it or because of the cost, um, physically put speakers higher or another or, um, in this or in the ceiling or or more speakers up all over the walls. So this allows you to use um, a height enabled speaker um, to bounce the sounds, ricochet the sounds off of the ceiling and back down to you. Of course, there's some stipulations. Um, Jim will tell you, you can get a, that there's ways that we've been able to bend these rules using Odyssey. But of course, you want the room, the, the ceiling should be flat. Why? Because I need there's a certain angle that I want that that speaker is built at a certain angle with a certain crossover point in it and a certain sound tuning to make it seem like it's coming from above you. The second I I angle this or vault the ceiling, I mess with the geometry and the sound does not come down where it's supposed to come down. It doesn't seem like it's coming from above you. It may not hit you properly. The sound may not strike you in your seating position properly. There's also an ideal height between seven and a half feet to 12 feet, um, which is good because that's based on that angle. Any taller than 14 feet, you're affecting the angle and where that sound is going to come back and strike you. And finally, it's good to make the sound, um, the, the, the ceiling has to be acoustically reflective. It has to be able to, to bounce the sound back. We have broken these rules. This is just a recommendation, but Jim will tell you that we have been to some ballrooms, conference rooms, meeting rooms, higher ceilings, lower ceilings, um, also drop ceilings, also the craziness. And um, by properly setting it up and utilizing Odyssey, we can still get a very immersive effect from that. I really like these definitive A9 height speakers because I like the fact that they, uh, a lot of times height enabled speakers look like one speaker sitting on top of another one. My wife didn't want me to put speakers hanging from the walls. So why, and she already thinks my speakers are, or my, she doesn't like the way my speakers look right now, these, these Wilsons. She would definitely not want me to put another speaker on top of another speaker. So this means a much more cosmetically pleasing, seamless looking appearance with great performance. Um, there's some tips when it comes to setting up um, height enabled speakers. One thing that I've done before is I take the Atmos test disk. And on the Atmos test disk, there is um, actual test tones. You go into the into the uh, area of it, and it will run a test tone, left, right, center, above, and everything else. I like to use those test tones instead of the test tones built into the AVR, because all of the Dolby Atmos or D processing has already been applied before that test tone is sent to the height-enabled speaker. So what I can do is a lot of times we'll take the test tone, run the front height, and then I can literally move the speaker back and forth until I get the right geometry so the sound hits the ceiling and comes down right 
at the sweet spot where I want the listener to actually hear it. So I can use that test tone um, to, to move the speakers back and forth or the seat back and forth to determine what's the best position um, to put those height enabled speakers. So that's just a little trick that I've used before to try to get the most out of height enabled speakers um, in difficult rooms. <laughs> I will add this, that one of the really big advantages of the height enabled speakers is that you can actually try it out in a room, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? If it's got a vaulted ceiling and Dolby says it won't work or if the ceiling's too high or this, what, whatever, you can actually hook those up, run Odyssey, mm -hmm. if you're using one of ours anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and give it a shot. See exactly. the results. You might be shocked. I certainly know that I have been, Phil has mm -hmm. been, mm -hmm. in various rooms we've been in. It, you just don't know until you give it a shot exactly and even if it's not perfect it will be it may be better and that better may still make it worthwhile for you to actually um purchase a pair of height enabled so, so let's talk more about dobe atmos first thing dobe atmos can support up to 35 channels or 35 speakers because remember it's actually 35 positions of speakers remember dobe atmos does not have channels it has objects so, but it can support up to 35 speakers in 35 different positions, 24.1.10. One thing I wanna stress, a lot of times you'll see people say, I have a, a, a 7.4.4 system. No, you don't. There's only one LFE channel, one, when it comes to Dolby Atmos. You may use six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 subwoofers, but they are all being fed the same signal. They may be EQ different. They may have different delay, timing delay applied to them to make the bass seamless, but there is only one LFE channel when it comes to Dolby Atmos, regardless of how many subwoofers you buy. Um, you can have up to 24 speaker locations around you, around the horizon, and up to 10 speaker locations above you. So that is the, the uh, that what the standard is for consumer applications. So as you can see, um, there there's a, there's a, there's a turnoff that can support this, but it, the average consumer who's buying a Denon or Marantz is not the guy that wants to put 35 um, speakers in a theater in his house in the south of France that he helicopters to, you know. Um, in his, you know, this is kind of most customers aren't this nutty, but as you can see, Atmos can actually go a long way. All right. So, so by the way, like I said, we have two subs, but they're playing the same thing. Um, we do allow you our, our mod, better models, allow you to EQ and, and each sub separate to make the bass more seamless, but it's still the same signal. All right. Um, if you look at our Denon and Marantz AVRs, we can support up to on our flagship models um, 13 channels and uh, or 13 speakers. And those speakers can be, you can use them as a 7.1.6 or a 9.1.4. Um, it's up to your preference. Um, do you want more height, you want, utilize the processing for more heights, or do you want to utilize it for more horizontal width? It's up to you. Um, I like to say, we do a lot of 7.1.6s. They seem to fit, because we use big speakers and it seems to fit in rooms a lot better. Um, but these are just uh, options for you. Hey, Phil, I'm going to weigh in just for a second mm -hmm. on the on the the idea of nine or front wides versus more in ceiling or mm -hmm. elevation speakers. It depends on the room that the customer's in. If they have a very wide room that's not very deep, which means their seating is going to be spread mm -hmm. as opposed to row upon row upon row. Mm -hmm. The front wides might give a better response. It depends on where your main ceilings are. Frankly, mm -hmm. it probably will. Mm -hmm. And since you're not covering as big a, an area on the top with row after row after row, you can get away with just four channels up there. And mm -hmm. as a reminder, <clears throat> remember that the six channels go from the front, center, back towards the rear, from the front to the back of the room. They don't go left to right. Mm -hmm. So again, it's going to depend on the room and the application, whether or not front yeah. wides are the desired option. 
but there are yeah. situations where that will give a better result. It depends on the room yeah. and the customer. The other thing you may notice that I want to point out is you'll see that they give you a variance of degrees from 30 to 22 for the fronts. Um, the reason why that changes is if I, I can, of course, I can move this speaker left and right, like uh, left, more left and more right. But the main thing is if I move this couch closer, because I'm looking at where that couch is located, it seems like it's way back. If I push this couch closer, I change the angles. This angle actually changes. So the depending on the position of the couch compared to the um, uh, the TV and the speakers will change the angle. So I push this couch forward, it will have a different of uh, it'll have a different angle um, to the to the main listener than if I pull the couch back. You will also notice that when Atmos does their drawings, the couch is actually pushed kind of further um, closer to the rears in their in their images than the main. So if you look here, the rears, it seems like the couch is close to the rears than it is the mains. I can pull that couch forward and make it more equidistant. If you look at the DTS drawings, that couch is always shown in the middle as being equidistant between all of the speakers. So a lot of times this difference in look and angles is just because of how they want to show you that um, that uh, um, their systems based on their um, on their drawings. The next thing, the receivers can support, and, the, and then our flagship receivers and, pro, and processors can support up to 13 channels. But if you look at something like a like an AV8805 or an X8500, there is a huge amount of options on where you can place those speakers. Remember I said that a Atmos can support up to 35 locations or 35 speaker locations. That gives you a lot of flexibility. You have 13 channels, but you have a lot of flexibility on where you can place those channels. Now, some of these channels, like this um, center height and the and the front high and the front and the front cent, the high center, is not really part of the Atmos standard, but all of the other ones are. So I can do something like um, um, in ceilings for the front, and maybe. Um, wall mounted angle down speakers for the rear. I can do angle mount speakers for the front and maybe Dolby enabled speakers for the rear. Uh, lots of flexibility. The system just wants to know what do you have and where is it located and the um, the video, pr the processor in the receiver uh, or and the object, the um, object um, renderer in the receiver will make sure that it, because it knows what you have, you get the best sound. So if you have in ceilings, make sure you tell the receiver it's in ceilings. If you have in, a combination of in ceilings and height enabled, tell the receiver that so it has the proper information in order to make its um, um, its calculations. The next thing, a lot of times people just can't put speakers in the ceiling. So this year, Adobe has introduced uh, Adobe Speaker Virtualizer. There's also DTS, um, um, virtual, virtual DTSX as well. And this basically allows those customers who cannot um, physically mount speakers, more speakers in their rooms, whether on the walls, on top of their speakers, or in the ceiling, to get a more immersive surround sound effect. A lot of times, Adobe Atmos, if I play a piece of Adobe Atmos content um, before, prior to this, if I had a 7.1 system, it would just ignore the Atmos information, which is why you would just get um, uh, Dolby, Dolby Digital Plus or, or Dolby True HD, and you would not get the Atmos logo. Now with this, this is the always defaulted to on. It will not ignore that information. The Atmos logo will come on, and, you, and it will take that information and use um, basic psychoacoustics playing with frequency and phase to make you feel like there's still a more immersive experience. Right now, this is available on the models that were released in uh, 2019, 2020 as of today. And that's the models going up to about the 3600 with more models to follow. But this is new. So this basically makes um, you let you take advantage of the Atmos, even if you do not have the ability to add additional speakers for that um, for height. The virtual analyzer, basically, it, the decoder goes in from the Adobe Atmos content, goes in. It goes to the object audio renderer. Oh, 
Um, and then once it is decoded, the virtualizer will take that 7.1.4 and make it 7.1.0, or take that 5.1.4 and make it um, and make it seem like uh, and make it sound right in a 5.1 system. If you have legacy content, um, the decoder can take that Dolby Pro logic or that older Dolby digital content. It can up mix it to 7.1.4, and you can still apply the virtualizer. So either way, the goal is to make it more immersive, give you more of that dome of sound that makes it more enveloping. There's a variety of different um, decoding capabilities in, in receivers, especially our Denon Amarantis, for all the different ones. Dolby Digital Plus, Dolby 2 HD, Dolby Atmos is available in Dolby Digital Plus and Dolby 2 HD. The difference is the amount of compression applied and what type of compression is utilized. Dolby Digital Plus is lossy compression. Best way of saying it, we take pieces that they take parts of the information and they throw it away. Um, loss, um, Dolby 2 HD uses less compression and it's lossless. If you buy a Blu-ray, the Dolby Atmos lives on as Dolby 2 HD. Most over the air, like Netflix, Amazon HD, your Roku, your um, that plays back on your Roku or your Apple TV uses Dolby Digital Plus, the lossy version. Still has the objects, still has the, it's still object based, still has the fixed, you know, stationary channels for your 7.1 and your 9.1 and your 5.1 and the 120 objects whizzing, the, uh, the other 120 plus objects whizzing around the room, it, they, but each of the objects are just compressed. Think of it like MP3 versus CD. MP3s are stereo, CD is stereo. It's just how, um, how much qu the quality and how much compression is applied to each channel. You will start to see more um, streaming services go beyond Dolby Digital Plus. Um, at first, there was not much of a need to do this because ARC could not support more than Dolby Digital Plus. And now you're going to start seeing that because it can support up to Dolby 2 HD because of eARC, as well as services are now realizing that people want it, um, you may start seeing Dolby 2 HD quality or Blu-ray quality coming from um, streaming services. Okay, some other things. The Dolby Up Mixer, you can also um, use that Up Mixer to take Dolby Pro Logic or Dolby Pro Logic 2 and up mix that um, in order to utilize the multi channel at most capabilities. So you end up with a more immersive um, sound from the older content as well. From your VCR, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Moving on, uh, uh, DTS X and the new DTS X Pro. Um, they're DTSX is also an object-based system. So a lot of concepts that we talked about, such as um, it, it uh, metadata for location, it still has that. It's just relate, it's related to the, it communicates it to the receiver differently. It still tells you how big the object is and how focused the object is. So that type of object-based thing is still also part of DTSX. Just like Dolby has a virtual, a speaker virtualizer, DTS-X has a speaker virtualizer. It's called DTS Virtual X. The one thing you'll notice is DTS-X has a logo for their virtual height um, processing. Um, Dolby does not. So you may see a DTS virtual logo on a box or on a website. You will have to scroll down into the features to see that it has Dolby, the Dolby speaker virtualizer because there is no um, released logo. This supports a maximum of 7.1.0. It has to be zero because the second I start adding height speakers, Adobe enabled speakers, and make that a 7.1.2 or 7.1.4 or other things, instead of using the virtual processing, the system will use the height speakers that are available instead. So in order for Virtual X to work, you have to have no height or no Dolby enabled speakers in your layout. Um, the, the same thing, tons of different versions of DTS um, that are available. And of course, the decoders that are found in our AVRs can decode all of them. The one that I really want to point out is at the bottom, DTS-X. Um, DTS-X is, um, is, is their object-based system. And on top of that, um, it is also used as the audio codec, the, the base layer 
that the IMAX enhanced information is applied upon. So Xperia owns IMAX and DTX. So they utilize, they take their IMAX content, um, figure out how to um, master it for the home, and they provide it to you in your home using the DTSX as a delivery system. Uh, and of course, DTSX has its up mixer as well that allows you to take stereo and multi-channel and give you and mix it into a object, into a multi-channel with height type application. We get asked a lot, what is the best up mixer? Because there's the Dolby up mixer, the, the Nero X, and even the Aromatic, which is the, R, the um, um, Aro 3D's up mixer. I say pick the mix, the, the one that sounds best to you. I have played with all of them. And depending on the content you're playing, whether it's a movie or music, um, they all have their own advantages. Just pick the one that you like. It just means that the benefit is uh, you bought multiple speakers. And by using one of the up mixers, you get if you want to use all those speakers, even when that information is not in the content, it will do it for you. And just pick the one that you believe sounds best. So Jim, you're going to say something? Please. Well, I was just going to, I'm just going to say that this, this year, actually last year, Dolby removed the option for using Neural X mm -hmm. as the uh, enhanced from a Dolby True HD or Dolby Digital Soundtrack mm -hmm. going up to and doing the rendering up to elevation speakers. They said, no more, mm -hmm. can't do that, got to stay in Atmos. So yes. to a large degree, which which format is best is going to depend on the content. You aren't going to get to make a choice. No, I was going to say, thank you, Jim, for bringing that up. Um, it used to be that you could mix and match. Some systems would not allow you to do that anymore. And this, and it's just based on what the um, Dolby said, we want to use our mix up mixer on our content. So it's not us. If that feature is gone, it is a request from the um, Dolby. So this is um, uh, DTSX Pro. It can support up to 32, 30.2. So guess what? Notice that 0.2. It actually has two discrete LFE channels. Atmos has one LFE channel. DTSX can have up to two. By the way, licensing limited the processing to 11.1. So the 13, the 30, the, the 30.2 has always been there. It's just that the if the chipsets that we bought based on the licensing could only be 11.1. .1. So what does that mean to you? It's the same content. If it's DTSX now um, and you're playing it back in 11.1, .1, DTSX Pro will play that same content back at up to 30.2. Okay. Some other things you're going to notice that's kind of unique. There, it has a overhead, a center height as well as a the center that goes above your TV, similar to RO3D. So you could have, um, so there's a, a lot more capabilities. If you look at the layout, the layout is based on the chair being dead center. If I pull it forward and, or I pull it back, there is a difference in the angles that are, that are listed and it will look very similar in those angles to what you will see from uh, Adobe Atmos. So the way that this looks has a lot to do with where they position the T, what they believe is the sweet spot or the reference spot for the chair. Okay. Both are backwards compatible. So you can use your DTSX layout with your Atmos layout. And I'll show you that a little bit later. The, um, there is a, of course, a decoder, like we talked about content goes in, it is decoded. If it is in DTSX, it will just go straight to the renderer in green, and it will look at all the speakers you have available, um, whether it's 5.1.4 or 7.1 or 11.1 or 7.1.4, whatever, and it will rent, it'll use those speakers. C currently, you were you are limited to 11.1, but now you are not. Um, and of course, it has an up mixer, so if it comes in as channels, it can up mix them to add the heights. And that includes not only their content, but other content that is not DTS content, um, PCM content, for example, multi-channel PCM. If we have a 13-channel AVR or processor with 13 channels, 
you get to use all 13 channels for DTS, um, DTSX. Before, you could only use 11, so 7.1.4. Now you can do 7.1.6. So if you want, you can have um, you can have the the traditional seven um, um, seven surrounds plus the six heights. You know, the four heights you already had plus the two middle heights. Now you can you could also do 7.1.6 with a um, a top surround, which is basically the one right above your head, which at which RO3D calls the voice of God, but they call it top surround, as well as a center height, which is was also an option in RO3D. And then you could also do um, four heights and a nine channel with front wides on the ground, similar to Atmos. Basically, the layouts you could do with Atmos um, that you could not do with DTSX, you could do those. And you can also use the layouts that were uh, possible with RO3D. So pretty slick. The 35 positions um, means you can have lots of different options on where those speakers are located, and you just tell the system where, how they're where they're located, and the system will use those speakers to the best of its ability to give you the best effect. Um, there's multiple ways that DTS content is mastered. Some is mastered at 5.1, some is mastered at 6 channels, some is mastered at 11 channels, some is mastered at 12 channels, 7.1.5. 7 uh, depending on how it's mastered, will determine which speakers are active. Um, we're, if, the, if you have NeuroX off, if you have it on, um, you, can do, you can actually up mix and utilize additional speakers. So for example, um, I can do seven with the, with the NeuroX off, depending on the content, I can, it'll do 7.2.5. I'd have my seven speakers over along the floor, my two subwoofers and a front height, a rear height, and a center height. If I turn the Neuro X on, I can have all those speakers plus that top surround, that voice of God speaker that Earl talks about, the top surround surround will be on as well. So we're gonna do a whole session when we get these AVRs or we get this update, and we will make sure that um, we walk you through the different configurations in the menu system. Um, moving on, I would like to talk a little bit about IMAX Enhanced. IMAX Enhanced is based on DTS-X. It's just a different way of um, expressing what you hear in the movie theater. IMAX movie theaters are laid out differently than a, uh, a standard movie theater. Their speaker layouts are different. The size of the speakers are different. The mix is different. On top of, the aspect ratio is different, and they also apply things such as digital noise reduction to their, um, uh, their exclusive digital noise reduction to the imagery to eliminate noise. So the picture looks different and it sounds different. When you walk into a, into a movie theater and to, to watch the Avengers, you'll see that the Avengers may be running on four different screens in four different formats. One may be widescreen, one may be Atmos, one may, one may be widescreen with DTS, one may be um, Dolby Vision and Atmos, and one may be IMAX. All three versions of the movie are different, and the experiences in each one of those theaters, um, cinemas, are different. As a customer, most of the time you only get one. You get the one that's on the disc. This disc gives you more choices. Which one is the best, IMAX Enhance, DTSX, or Atmos? It's the one that you like. And our goal is to make sure that you have access to the different formats so you could pick the one that you like. Because the speakers are laid are different, um, uh, it has to be mixed differently. They're located differently. And by using, oh, and by the way, IMAX is a channel-based system. So IMAX is still based on channels. But what they're using is the object-based system to make believe, to make you think that that channel, that big old channel is sitting over there in the corner. If you turn on your receiver, you will see whenever IMAX content is um, um, appears, you will see that an IMAX logo will appear um, as well as DTSX. Remember DTSX is the base layer, but now we're applying IMAX processing to make it seem like it is in an IMAX theater. As a customer, set your receiver up like you normally do. As an installer, set up like you normally do. Um, do all of your stuff for DTS to make DTS-X and Atmos sound great. 
and the receiver will use that as a baseline and apply a diff additional base management equalization and level adjustments to make it seem more like an IMAX experience. Um, you can turn it on, off, or have it auto. Auto means whenever you see an IMAX flag, switch into IMAX processing. Um, on means whenever I see, if whenever I play any DTS material, switch, use the IMAX processing. And off means even if I see IMAX content, just use DTS processing. If IMAX is working, you will get an indication on your screen. You will see IMAX. It'll say IMAX across um, under the menu system and, um, when it's ever when it is detected. When it is not detected, it is not an option. You will not see it. Only when the content is detected. If you have a Blu-ray player, um, because remember we talked about the base layer is could be 7.1 or 9.1, um, and those basically they took the um, eight objects for 7.1 and 10 objects for 9.1 and made them stationary. Those are what you normally see listed. Um, then um, the, the way that you'll see that the IMAX um, information is available is if you bring up the, the Den and Ormorant's info screen. So a lot of times you will not see that if you look at the Blu-ray player's info screen, you will see it on the Den and Ormorant's info screen. If it does not say IMAX enhanced, it is not processing in IMAX enhanced. Um, some other things, base management. When, when it was developed, um, a lot of times IMAX speakers are full range. Even THX theaters speakers are not full range. They are gigantic and they are designed to play bass. Um, and so at, at higher levels, at higher volumes. So in order to protect the average consumer speaker systems, which are not full range. You may think your floor standing speaker is full range, but it doesn't play down to 23 Hertz. Most speakers do not. Um, and in order to prevent them from being damaged, they applied a fixed predetermined um, low pass and high pass filter to protect your speakers. There are ways, like we do a lot of demonstrations with like six 9080s and no subwoofer and you want those speakers to play full range. You do have the ability, IMAX has given us permission, um, to, um, have, to have the ability to make those adjustments so I can run um, my, my full range speakers, my true full range speakers, full range. Um, and there's different combinations and based on those combinations, you will get different results. I don't have time to go through all of this. I am going to provide this to you and then we're going to do a video on base management. But I do want to point a few things out here um, while we're in this presentation. Um, you, uh, I'm going to bring up my menu system for my AV8805. Um, this is the, if you're not aware, of, you have the ability to access your receiver or your AV pre-pro from Denon and Marantz um, by typing in this IP address and use your laptop to navigate the menu. But all of these selections are also available if I bring up the on-screen menu on my receiver. If I click on audio here, you'll see that it has this thing called sound parameters. And if I go here and say I have my media PC selected, because I'm using my TV right now to look at the presentation we're doing. If I go to sound parameters, you will notice that there's not a lot of options because it's only in stereo. If I go to surround, basic surround, Dolby Digital or DTS, I will get even more parameters. Now, if I am playing a piece of IMAX content, like right now I am playing the IMAX demo disc in my, um, my Blu-ray player. Make sure it comes up, see if it's still playing. Oh, just, yep. If I click here, now because I am playing IMAX material, you will notice that a whole bunch of IMAX adjustments come up. So now I have IMAX. Do I want it to be that the whole thing about auto? Do I want it to be on or off? Um, that's do I, do I want to play it when I see it or not? The next thing is it right here, it's set to auto. It means use the base management that is recommended by IMAX uh, in order to protect my speakers and get the most impact. If I want to go in and modify it, if I switch that to manual, then all of the IMAX adjustments come up so that I can adjust my low pass, my high pass, my subwoofer mode. So, I, so all of the, the things that are listed in the PowerPoint 
in order to make those adjustments to do what you want it to do, you have to be able to be, you have to be playing a piece of IMAX content at the time in order to do that. So like I said, to make all these adjustments in this parent's presentation, it needs to be, um, it needs to be set. Actually, let me put my screen back up. Um, you need to be playing a piece of IMAX content um, on your display in order for you to utilize um, to make these adjustments. So a lot of times people say, I can't see all the IMAX settings. They don't exist. Well, you have to be playing IMAX content because it says if you're not playing IMAX, you should be messing with these settings. You know, so why would I show them to you? Okay, so this basically walks you through. Um, the other thing too is the size of your speakers. Like right now, say I was using multiple BP towers, I set the fronts, the surrounds, and the surround backs to large because I'm using 690-80s. Uh, and, and then the front Dolby, the surround Dolby, and the back Dolby is set to small because they're using the little height-enabled speakers on top. And then the center channel is also set to small. Now, you can also go in here, and if you look under here, it says individual. I have the center channel set to 40. Why? Because a lot of the fan of center channels have a subwoofer built into them, so they can play pretty low. But the front, but the height enabled speakers that are on top of the 9080s are crossed over at 100 to make to protect them from getting too much bass. And then, of course, down here, I can go in and make those adjustments to high pass, low pass, and subwoofer on and subwoofer off. So you have a lot of options here. Oral 3D, um, kind of a difference between Oral 3D and the rest of the of the of the options. Oral 3D is a channel-based system, but it uses three layers, not two. The systems we've talked about were object-based using uh, two layers of speakers. This is channel-based using three layers of speakers, and their channel layouts are unique. Um, 9.1, 10.1, 11.1, 13.1. Normally, Aural 3D supports surround height speakers, but not rear height. But a lot of customers have rear heights. So um, they have given Denon and Morant's permission to use rear heights for Aural 3D playback, as well as Dolby enabled speakers for Aural 3D playback, because that is not part of their standard bouncing speak sounds off of the ceiling. But they have given us the ability to do that. And then also, um, Aromatic is their up mixer to up mix sound. When I said there's three layers, there's three layers. Normally, when you look at um, Atmos and DTSX, you have layer one, which is that horizontal layer that goes around you. And then you just basically have a height layer of stuff that goes, um, that flies over your head. But there could be a gap or in space between the stuff that's going around you and the stuff that's going above you. So Oral 3D has three layers, a layer for stuff that flies over your head, a layer of stuff that's above you that are that is taller than you, and then a layer of stuff that's the same height as you. So it basically fills in any gaps to make the mix more seamless is what the concept of it is. Their layouts are different. So here are the three layouts you'll normally see. 11.1, which includes the, the, uh, the top surround, which they call the voice of God. Um, and then also a center height channel, and that is found in the 11.1. When I go to 10.1, I still get the voice of God, but I don't get the center height channel. And when I go to 9.1, that is very similar to a traditional 5.1.4, which means there is no um, center height and there is no voice of God. Um, it all you have there is the content is mixed in the variety of ways 11.1 10.1 9.1 so it's um, the content is mixed this way and there's different layouts that are available you can play 11.1 on a 9.1 system it would just take the um, top and center height and try to utilize the speakers that are available um, it has its own renderer like we talked about before content that's already in the format We'll just go right through the, the decoder and anything else, mono, stereo, surround can be up mixed using their aromatic. And like I said, a lot of people really love their, their up mixer and you can play, um, you can give it a shot. Real quick for setups, because I know, and then we can answer Jim's questions. People ask, are there different setups? If you look at John, the, the, the two handouts, um, there is a 20 page one just on speaker setup. 
And yes, there are some ways that you can completely optimize this. And John Heron, who's my buddy over at Trinoff who wrote those, um, uh, they will show you exactly how to do it for their multiple speakers and their crazy systems. But the fact is most customers are, are gonna tap out at 7.1.4 and they're worried that they wanna make sure that it's gonna sound good on both formats. And the answer pretty much is yes. If you look here, this is Dolby Atmos and this is IMAX Enhanced. IMAX Enhanced likes that couch to be dead center, equidistant between these. If you look here, the Dolby Atmos setting has the, the, the couch pushed back a little bit. But if I push that couch forward, um, these angles will change and it'll be very close to this. You notice that the azimuth, which is the angle that that speaker is pointed at you, they recommend 30 degrees. If you look here, the Atmos is 30 to 22. So if I pull, push the couch equidistant, you're probably gonna get the 30. If you look at the back, it says the, um, the backs for Atmos should be 135 to 150. If I pull, push the couch forward, I'm going to go closer to um, 135, which is the angle for DTSX. So, and remember, DTSX is also the layer for IMAX Enhanced. Um, also, these angles work fine for Atmos for Oro 3D. So, if I set up a, a 7.1 to sound good um, um, using uh, the Adobe Atmos numbers, it's going to sound good just fine, very good in DTSX and IMAX. Could I tweak it a little bit more? Possibly, but, um, but it's still gonna sound very, very good. There is a difference when it comes to the angle of approach. The, um, the, uh, because the speakers uh, are, the center, the, the height speakers are closer to the listener, the angle of approach is going to be a little different than what you would notice on a pair of in-ceiling mounted um, Dolby Atmos speakers. But to be honest with you, if you have a wide dispersion um, set of in-ceilings, that difference is not gonna make much of a difference when it talks about the impression of objects flying over your head. So most people aren't gonna put speakers in the ceiling for Dolby Atmos and a second set of speaker, four speakers in the ceiling for DTS. You don't really have to do that. The, 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 uh, it's close enough to make it work well. The X8500 and the AV8805 has 13, point, uh, 13 channels of surround processing and one LFE. I hate when it says two channel, one LFE, but that LFE can be divided into two channels for equalization and timing and things like that. It, it right here shows you the different speaker options. If you look, they all use the front center surround surround back um, speakers. Um, they all use the front height speakers and they all use the rear height speakers. Um, whether you're using RL 3D, whether you're using DTSX, whether you're using Dolby Atmos, it's, that's 11.1. The other two channels are applied differently based on the technology. DTS uh, currently did not support anything, so you were at 11, point, your 11 channels, you were done. The 13 channels for Atmos, that extra channel was applied to the top middle or the, the front wides, depending on what you wanted to do. But this system, the top middle is where it was applied. For Oral 3D, those other two channels were applied to the center height and the top surround. So what you could do with our receivers is there's 15 binding posts on the X8500 and 15 pre-outs on the AV8805. So if you have enough amplification um, for the 8805, or you use the connect the additional speakers to those other binding posts, you can go into the receiver and make a quick adjustment and the power will be redirected um, from those other, the channel 12 and channel 13 to optimize the experience when it comes to Dolby Atmos at 7.1.6 that is directed to those, could be directed to those center heights. And um, and in RO 3D, it's connect. It's directed to the top surround and the center height, or I can direct that um, those um, channel 12 and 13 to the front wides for 7.1.4, and in a, a, a real quickly in the remote control, redir redirect it for RO 3D to the the center height 
and the top surround. Um, is that what you needed to see, Jim? Yeah, um, but uh, one quick note. You can't quickly switch that with the remote in yeah. any of the products that you can buy today. Today. Um, yeah, we realize that, but if someone wants to make that quick adjustment for these two formats, that's perfectly fine. If they're not, if they're using an 11 channel system, 11 channel Atmos, 11 channel um, IMAX um, uh, DTSX and 11 channel Oro 3D using 7.1.4, no switching is necessary because the positions are very common between all of those particular speakers. It's just so, if I want to use the 13 channel is when I got to do this. Correct. And you have to change it in the menu. You have to change it in the menu. In the menu currently. We're For working on a product that you can buy today. today. Uh, that's all <laughs> we're going to say anymore. I can't tell you what. I can't tell you when. But um, it's going to be easier in the future. Okay. That's called foreshadowing. Oh, Wait, go back. Go back okay. for a second. <laughs> so if you are going to set a system up that is going to be optimized for Oral 3D and let's be honest, the DTSX Pro speaker setup is exactly the same. They just don't call it voice of God. And then with Atmos, you've got an extra pair mm -hmm. in the middle in the mm -hmm. ceiling. So Jeff, your question was about are you are you doing angling towards the listen area or aim down? It depends on how many you have, number one. And number two, it depends on how you're going to assort it. If everything goes in the ceiling, don't angle them down or angle them towards the listen area. You just have to have good dispersion pattern. What you don't want are beamy speakers up exactly. in the ceiling. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Now, so remember but but I want to point out, if you're going to optimize a system for IMAX, DTSX, Atmos, and Oro 3D using the boxes as you see there, not the ones in the ceiling, on the front and the back are the best way to go. Why would here, you want to optimize for here, Oro 3D? And here, and here, and here is what he's talking about, right, Jim? This guy right Yeah, this that's guy. why I wanted the illustration before because it was more it's clear. Easy. Okay. But boop, 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 why boop, would boop, you want to do it for Oro 3D? Because on the interweb, where everybody gets their information and they know that it's absolutely true, people talk about voice of God and you have to have the voice of God speaker. You have to have it. Even though in the US there's almost no content available in Oro 3D. If they bring up the voice of God, number one, you've got to look at our AVRs that do IMAX Enhanced and Oro 3D and DTSX and mm -hmm. Atmos. Mm -hmm. And number two, you're going to want to use those boxes like that is the preferred arrangement because that's really the way Oro 3D is mixed to mm -hmm. have that layer effect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which means you have to have elevated height channels. And at that point, in the front and the back, at that point, those need to be angled down. If okay. you're putting oh. them in the ceiling, don't angle them. Phil was talking about because he has a, a vaulted, vaulted ceiling. ceiling, he was correcting for the vault. Exactly. Oh, by the way, there's one last thing about the conversation he just had. If you look here, DTSX is only 11.1, right? The new DTX Pro is 13.2. Two, so the only difference would be, um, and I could t these speakers that are used for Oral 3D are also a spec for D for IMAX Enhance for this location. So, so um, if you utilize um, this setup, not only will you be using it for Oral 3D, you're also going to be using it for DTSX. Remember, all of the content that you have right now that's DTSX is also DTSX Pro. There's no new content, so immediately. That voice of God and that center height that would only be used for Oral 3D can be used for another format as well. So, so keep that in mind. All right. So one more thing before I let you guys go. Um, use Odyssey. Um, you'll be amazed at how well the Odyssey works if you take multiple measurements. Eight positions. Take all eight positions. The other thing we tell you to do is get, use the app to make the calculations. The receiver. Um, the microphones, 
uh, provides the receiver with the measurements. The receiver sends the measurements to your smart device. Your smart device does the calculations and sends the measurements back to your receiver. What I like about it as well is, of course, you have more ability to adjust the curve. Um, a lot of times people just want to, uh, they, they like their high frequency. It's just a problem with the base. That's where most of the problems occur. You can literally just limit Odyssey to just working on getting rid of peaks and dips in the base. And you also get the before and after. You can also run a eight mic position calibration and save it. It's like in my room with my curtains open and my, and my flat panel. And then a second eight uh, position calibration for my curtains closed and my screen down because it has a big impact on the sound. And I can load those different um, calibrations from the app to the receiver um, before I drop the screen. So there's some cool things about this application. We have done what this helps you get over solve a lot of issues with speaker positioning and angle and level and the ceiling may be vaulted and the and the it's too tall or it's too low. Um, this is a great way to try to get more out of the performance in the room that you have. Um, before I let you guys other, go. Phil, before you yes. do that, the other advantage of the app is it actually is going to use your smart device to do the high level math, which is what room correction is. Yes. And the smart device is going to do a better job with high level math than the just smart enough devices built into the AVRs. And exactly. Joe, the the uh, the larger answer to your question, his question was front speakers set to small. What do you recommend for subwoofer LFE and front crossover settings? It's going to vary from speaker to speaker to speaker, depending on what the speaker is capable of producing, mm -hmm. which is why my suggestion is let Odyssey or whatever AVR you're using make that decision based on how the speaker sounds in the listening position. And exactly. I would let it do that. Can you tweak exactly. them after the fact? Yeah, you can mess with the crossover settings. But yes. since it's getting the information based on where the where in the room it is, it's like Phil, when we do Odyssey, we always set the room or the woofers to noon. Mm -hmm. Right? And then yep. if we want a little more bass in the room, what do we do? We turn them up. Because yep. after the we setting. like bass. By exactly. the way, just so you know, because Phil has his UI screen on there, the user interface where you can use a phone or a laptop to do the setup. Just so you know, the app does not, it bypasses that. You can't yes. use the laptop. You're going to use your smart device. Yes. Use the app. It's 20 exactly. bucks. It's well worth the money. Exactly. So what I did was I can go in here manually and override and make some adjustments. So for example, in my house, uh, my center is, um, is I have set for 80. My mains I have set to 40. They're Wilson Watt puppies. They're, I don't care. They're not full range. There's very few speakers that can go all the way down to 20 hertz. So it is nice to have a little bit of that leftover bass sent to the subwoofers to assist my large floor standing speakers. But I can, but all that stuff can be, but let the receiver, it will tell you. It may break your heart. You may think your speakers are large, and that system may look at it and say, ah, uh, no, they're not. Odyssey will tell, tell you what it's getting from your speaker in your room and whether or not that speaker is considered large based on its ability to handle frequencies. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're, um, we're growing, we're at 826 people. Yay, in a, in a month. Um, we're gonna add more things to this, shorter videos. First, you have these big lecture series with shorter videos on base management for IMAX, whether or not you use the LFE on a subwoofer. That was a big conversation um, uh, this morning. There'll be lots, we're going to continue to add lots of little five minute, two minute, three minute things as well. So if you're not a subscriber to the YouTube, the training uh, YouTube channel, um, please subscribe. So we're going to let you guys go. And uh, thanks again for Jim and Jen for putting this together and answering the questions. And hopefully we will see you again soon.